Hi, I'm Raven Perez, creator of Raven's Dojo. That's ravensdojo.com, where you'll find Raven's Dojo the comic over 1,200 pages free, as well as my side comics like Devil Powered Witches, Home, Fuck Button, and more. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And, of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. I can take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> we are joined today by a returning guest. I have not talked to him since 2013. Back, way the fuck back when. Um, he is a very talented comic artist. He's just finished up his series called Raven's Dojo. Of course, we are joined today by the ever talented Raven Perez. How you doing, Jay Raven? Hey, man, I'm fantastic. <laughs> like probably never better. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. You know, 2013. Holy shit! Long time. Seriously. Like I, I, I look back at the archive, and I'm like, episode 287 was when you you were last on the show, which is crazy in itself. Think about how different the world is since we talked. Like, really, like, that's the theme for this whole interview is everything's different. Like, it's, like, shit's the same, but, like, everything's completely different. The world went through, like, we have a plague now. And, like, we had a Trump administration, <laughs> which was a goddamn nightmare I couldn't wake up from. I don't know about you. And then, like, just, I don't like there's nfts and all this bizarre like the world is fucking bizarre there's playstation fives now what the fuck like the world's weird dude it's that was, weird that was just weirder a, than ever we have death pestilence plague i mean all you need to do is win the lottery and you got the trifecta you're all set. bring it man bring those locusts <laughs> slay those firstborns i'm down for it sure <laughs> whatever biblical references i never paid attention to in church it's the only ones anyone knows you know <laughs> tablet stone tablets um plagues parting of a river of some kind uh -huh. river so, yeah. yeah red red uh sea red sea yeah, yeah. uh and then i think uh armageddon yeah. that's all anybody knows the horseman horseman oh, of course yeah. i have some horsemen yeah <laughs> oh the rapture i forgot oh, right yeah. i thought those were hand in hand but who knows <laughs> ding <laughs> one so we have an ongoing game going on to see how many times the cat jumps up on the table during the interview so those that get to count, uh, make sure you comment down below in the video to see what happens. So there we go. 2013, you're in yep. the middle of your Kickstarter for your very first book. Yep. It's 2021. <laughs> what the hell has changed? Oh my God, man. Like, so the thing is, is last time me and Kurt talked, like I, I don't know if the book had succeeded just then or was it like, right in the line we, you remember we were in the middle of it actually in the middle Ooh, okay so like the book basically uh was supposed to be this huge turning point and it was kind of like i'm constantly evaluating like uh you know the business constantly evaluating like comics and stuff like is this viable is that viable whatever um when we talked the book hadn't hit its goal and i honestly thought i was like well you know this shit is not going to hit its goal right and so i was like because i was a huge 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 number away from success i called that experience having the mirror of truth held up to your life like, everything i thought i knew like that kickstarter revealed to be like wrong like i thought i had like more readers than i had and i thought i was going to have more success and basically literally every single thing that i thought it went the complete other way like some of my oldest friends like didn't show up at all or help at all and then people that like i didn't ever think would help were like the hugest help even down to like the fucking reward tiers the way i had structured that damn thing was that i did a year like i did a year of study and research before i did that and everything i saw said that like you had maybe just a few big backers and then like most of the campaign would be carried by low tier, like small backers, right? And my campaign was the complete opposite. Everybody snapped up really high tier rewards. It was hard as fuck to fulfill everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> because all those rewards were labor intense and I was 
relying on people that weren't coming through and stuff like that. So, but that was supposed to be the big turning point for Raven's Dojo. I was going to like get this professionally printed book in China and it was going to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with anything you get in retail at the time. Back in 2012, POD was shitty. Mm -hmm. And it, you could really tell the difference between a POD book and like a book that was printed at an offset printer. Yeah. It's not like that anymore. Doesn't it's that's changed shortly after our interview. Like I was gearing up to fail and I was like, well, I need to have another thing. So I was like, I started actually <laughs> learning how to like do some game dev, like video games and stuff, because I was like, well, fuck, you know, if the book fails, then I got to do something else. Yeah. So I'll, I'll crank out like, video games or something well at any rate like in the last two hours the book made the two thousand dollars that it needed to succeed nice and so I, I always call that the miracle of 12 12 12 because on december 12 2012 it succeeded that threw me for the hugest loop because all of a sudden now this thing that was like definitely going to fail succeeded and i'm like oh shit well i gotta focus on this kickstarter but at the same time like in my life i remember looking at my like partner at the time at my girlfriend and i was like you know I, I feel like the funny thing is is that this will succeed because it would actually be the worst time for this to succeed because we're moving from like not just a little move but like eight hours to a whole nother state wow. and like we we're just changing everything right and so obviously it'd be easier to do that if you have nothing going on instead of you know trying to fulfill a goddamn kickstarter yeah we move we go to pittsburgh like i'm fulfilling this kickstarter it's slow like china dealing with china is slow but everything does come together in the end like despite the fact that everybody's like flaking hardcore left and right mm -hmm. on like things they said they would help me do it's like it all comes together and then like kurt that's when the shit hits man that's when everything goes south but all that's important to say is that like every single thing like in my life life fell apart right like, I thought I was going to be, like, homeless and shit. Like, it was bad. Like, there were, uh, if you remember Project Wonderful, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm bringing in all these webcomic, oh, yeah. all, all, all these webcomic references for this, man. Webcomic people got a lot to, like, be like, oh, uh, there was a time when my Project Wonderful ads were, like, the only thing that was feeding me. Like, Raven's Dojo was, like, the only real, like, source of extra income I had. And like, it wasn't pulling in anything. Anybody who ever had a project wonderful knows that you were probably only making like 15 or 20 bucks off that thing anyway. Well, that like that was the money I had for food, right? And so I was just like, God damn, you know, what's gonna become of me? Like, remember that I'm supposed to pivot and I'm supposed to start going to conventions and like getting this book out in front of people and i'm supposed to start like you know driving all over america and i got friends from coast to coast who were like yeah man just come crash with me and this con's good and this con's good and like you know you can just stay with me so it'll be free or whatever else but like i couldn't even afford gas you know what i mean or like let alone plane tickets or bus tickets or whatever else couldn't when you're when you're super poor you can't afford to miss work like that's the other like even if somebody's like dude i'll I'll pay for you to come out here and you can stay with me for free and we'll split a table. And it's like, I get your costs real, real low, but like missing work is a problem. If you're too like poor, you know, you, you just can't afford to miss the income, right? <laughs> <laughs> Books did not become the thing that they were supposed to be. Right. So, cause it was supposed to be, even when I did that book, I had like, three i had like two more in the can ready to go and the idea was it's like okay well now that i have a book like i'll use the books to help fund the other books and then the future kickstarters will just get easier and easier because there'll be revenue from the books that will help the other books exist yeah none of that happened it ended up being that like life just became a matter of like how to survive right like it was survival mode and at the same time, I was like, I've been in tight spots. Like, I'm going to keep the dojo going. I just can't worry about these books. Like, if you just can't make books, you can't make books. Like, that's that, right? Books uh, got backburnered so long that I just realized I was like, you know, it's taking me, like, forever to claw out of this hole. I was like, I got to start thinking of something else, right? So I started doing, you know, looking at what everyone else was doing. And at this point, 
the landscape has changed and everybody is doing like uh, Patreon and paywalls and subscriber content and shit like that. The dojo is going to become black and white so that it can be easier to print, cheaper to print. And it'll also become faster. I was doing like two, maybe three color pages a week. I can do what much more, you know, let's just get rid of color. And everybody was like, oh, no, no, Raven, I think you're fucking up. I just had a feeling that it would be okay. I was like, if I make these like more frequently, it'll balance out. Like people won't care. I'll lose some people. But like for the most part, like people won't give a shit. I started doing stuff black and white. I called it Super Raven's Dojo. And I said to myself, I'm going to do a book a year. I've been able to keep that pace ever since. Feeling like a fucking champ for keeping that pace. You can call this show like the, the bad choices of Raven Perez. Like this is kind of like what not to do, kids. Don't do what I do. Like avoid my fuck ups. The story that I decided to do, I'm like cranking out at this point, like five pages a week. No sweat. I have a story in my head and this is the exact time to tell it when I have like, you know, this fast pace, I'm basically creating a new jump on point for like new readers. I'm going to tell this story that I have waited my entire life to tell. Right. And that's the story arc that I just wrapped up. Basically like me and you were talking before the show and you said is even at the top of the show, you said, is this the end of Raven's dojo? Yeah. Let me just say, not the end of Raven's Dojo. I'm going to do Raven's Dojo till the day I die. However, because I always have excitement and enthusiasm for these characters. Yeah, sure. However, like, I just have had some, like, super heavy stuff happen to me in life, right? And so I had somebody hit me, like, somebody near and dear hit me with, like, uh, they're like, well, what if I die before you finish? And I was just like, God damn, you know, that's like really brutal, heavy kind of like stuff, you know, but I have had, I've been doing this comic since 1998, right? Mm -hmm. It's like 23 years. I've had people die while I was working on the dojo, right? And I was just like, I don't like that. Part of like the thing I like about indie comics is you get closure. If you're reading corporate comics, Spider-Man and Batman, they're going to be around long after you die. It's just a fact of life. I feel like if you are reading indie comics, like you should get closure. Like as long as One Piece is running, you still know that at the end, like they're gonna find One Piece. Like that's the end of it, right? Yeah. And so I was just like, I need, I, I should give people closure, right? I was like, it's not fair to people to like just have this. And that was never the idea anyway. Like I never was like, hey man, let's just do the same shit forever. Cause that's tired. Let's have this comic be the origin story of Raven's Dojo. It's like the genesis of like why the book is called Raven's Dojo. It's the genesis of like the boys. It's their long forgotten past. Like since 1998, I've been talking about like their past. And it's like, oh, they have the secret past and oh, they were forgotten and oh, they, they used to be big world famous heroes. And then I was just like, well, let's just show that. Let's just tell that story. Like, people have waited at this point, from 1998 to 2017, people have just been, like, it's just been the status quo, right? And I never meant it to go that long. I was like, look, like, you know, I was actually like, let's wrap that up. So this story that I told, that I just wrapped up, the reason why it's like, feels so final and it's such a big deal and it's a big deal to me and it's a big deal to the readers and everything else like it's got answers to plot points that I've been doing since 1998. Like I set a joke up in issue five and it paid off in issue 33. When I say it feels like the end, you know, it's not the end because I still have way more stories that I want to do and way more stories that like, there's tons more adventures and jokes. But uh, it's the end of like that era for sure the whole like forgotten past like it's the end of like the main villains that have been there since 1998 it's the end of all that stuff like if you die and that's all you read like you you got an end like it ends happy <laughs> the boys are married like all this crazy shit happens that like i'm sure people never thought they would see in there you talk a lot about a lot of heavy stuff i mean to be honest like your life hasn't been spectacular hopefully you're in a good place right now oh yeah Okay. always always in a good even at my worst 
I'm always in a good headspace. Okay. Well, because it can always be worse. So <laughs> not a sweat. So with, with the comic though, with all the trials and tribulations you've gone through, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned from finishing up Raven's Dojo? I mean, you really just have to work on these things. It has to come from just a place of passion because you're not promised uh, any kind of reward. Like there's no uh, promise of any kind of kudos or compensation. Like, you know, me and you uh, were talking about how, you know, you put in a lot of work. I think you said you've done over a thousand interviews. Yeah. 12 and years. Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. And, and, and so that's the thing. It's like, so you relate. You totally relate. Right. It's like you can pour your heart and soul into these projects and you're not guaranteed any kind of like high five at the end of the day. I had a lot of personal people just, you know, like happy for me. I read in a book once that they said that like no one's going to actually care about your actual comic but like they'll, they might be happy that you're doing something mm -hmm. but like they probably like you know odds are they're not going to really give a shit about what you're doing and you just have to be able to work past that like it has to be fulfilling for you and it has to be something that enriches your life even if there is no like 70,000 shares and like any big payday at the end of it. It's personally gratifying beyond belief to finish this story. Like more than anything, make the work that you need to see out in the world. Hmm. That's cliche, but it's just true. But it works though. I mean, yeah. you're right. You, you have to have passion for what you're doing. I mean, if you would have asked me back in 2008 that 12 years down the road, I'd be a solo host doing interviews in the entertainment industry still i probably would have said now give me five years and that's it <laughs> five years well here's the thing is that like sidebar for the other thing is just like you know your best laid plans don't don't put too much <laughs> <laughs> faith in that <laughs> yeah don't don't put too much faith in those plans I kind of like put that, it was funny, it was like, without even trying, that was just a message. It was part of that last story arc. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't, don't really uh, kill yourself over your plans, you know? But like in 2012, if you'd asked me if I was going to be anywhere remotely where I am now, I'd have been like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? Like, get out of here. Like, I, like, no, how would that even work out? And yet here we are. It's like, as long as you can find I think uh, peace of mind in what you do, as long as it like enriches you. I also think two people will respond to that. Like if they see the passion, people will react. Like, I think it's important. I, I see a lot of young creators struggle and I just, I wish I could tell them that like, no matter how little like, you know, comes your way or how much at the end of the day, like you just have to have your shit be like gratifying for you. <laughs> But then, as a turn of phrase, though, you also see, you know, seasons, seasoned artists are going through the ringer because someone decides to change their artwork. And it's oh, yeah. like, I mean, here's <laughs> you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'm curious about that, too. But here's the one <laughs> thing. I, so my background is computer science, computers in general. If you would have told me halfway through my career that I would be going back to university to learn art and to learn film i would mm -hmm. have told you you're crazy right but my first day of class i had to learn how to draw color wheels <laughs> <laughs> and so the teacher that i had i i said the phrase art is in the eye of the beholder and she led into me for 30 minutes saying that no art is not in the eye of the beholder art is is not subjective it is what the artist wants it to show hmm well, that's one way to think about it, I guess. I guess. But then you have J. Scott Campbell getting his art torn to pieces by an armchair artist slash a person, keyboard warrior, whatever. I mean, art styles are completely different from decade to decade. Hell, century right. to century for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> but when you decided to jump into this fray, at least with commenting, etc., and and style I and mean, we'll talk about your change of career as well too because i think it all flows into each other <laughs> it's uh, all connected yeah yeah perfect so so why did you want to jump into that 
that foray? Um, here's the thing. Uh, first up, I just want to say that, like, you know, you don't have to love his artwork. Like, you don't. No one has. No one has to love anyone's artwork. Like, art can make you mad. It's fine. And if art pisses you off, I mean, at least it did something. Like, the worst crime art can have is to be mediocre, to inspire nothing. And uh, you know, if his art makes you pissed off cool like that's fine actually if you hate it that's fine um the reason why i said anything at all was because just as an artist i think it's kind of disrespectful to try to fix another art artist's art um i feel like there was a lot of stuff that was just sort of like you know egregious it, there was even the link it's like oh i'm inspired by fix bad art blog on Tumblr, and I was just like, uh, you know, I mean, here's the thing, is it love his work or hate it, like, here's a guy who has made a career of his art style, and he is, um, you know, not churning out what is, uh, like, popular in contemporary superhero comics, it's definitely not, um, it's got its fans for sure, but like, I mean, you know, it's not the style like the style is less gratuitous and objectifying the only reason why i went to bat for him is i was just felt like it was an egregious thing for an artist to correct another artist and i think that like also too it's a weird there's a weird sort of like ageist kind of uh vibe out there where you have a lot of uh, people think it's cool and acceptable to shit on older artists and even for decades old work, like that cover was from like 20 years ago, or 2009, yeah. I think. Don't, you know, swear to it. I just don't give a shit enough to really like commit that to memory. Yeah. But it was like, it was from, it was decades old work. It was over a decade, right? Yeah. And so it's kind of like, you know, I've seen J. Scott Campbell say, he was like, you know, I just wonder if ever, if anybody realizes that like, if I was maybe approached to do this stuff now, like I wouldn't necessarily take the same approach. Like, you know, life has moved on. I even like the point I made is I was like in 2014, um, he did that Riri Williams, the Ironheart uh, character cover. And a lot of people thought it fucking sucked and they shit all over him because it was objectifying uh, the way, you know, he drew her and she's a teenager and all this stuff. And, um, so he went back of his own accord and he did a new one based on the feedback. And the new one was unquestionably better. Mm -hmm. Nobody could say that it wasn't a superior cover. Uh, it was better drawn. It was less like gratuitous or whatever else. But like the, the trick is what sort of kills me about this. It ties to my like distaste of corporate comics is that you've got creators um, out there and they get raked over the coals but you know these are everything in corporate comics is work for hire it's all freelance right you're just contract labor like not even contract like it's like hey draw this cover for us here's the money you know you might get residuals you might not but like for the most part it's work for hire right so he was asked to do that cover and for the reason that he provides the style that he does so it's like, if you want to get mad, get pissed off at Marvel. You know what I mean? If you want to get mad, get pissed off at DC. Get up, get pissed off at editorial. And I remember, like, way back when there were those cover scandals, like Spider-Woman's butt and all that mm -hmm. stuff, um, nobody was directing shit at corporate. Was Everybody famous. was directing shit right at the artist, right? Yeah. And I even remember that they released a statement where editorial was like well i think artists just want to they just draw what they want to see and it's like they totally threw the artist under the yeah. bus right and i'm just like hey look man that's an employee and he just did what you told him to and yes i know that j scott campbell draws that way like in his own free time and like that's his style and i'm not trying to pretend like oh man you know, come on he was asked to do but i'm saying that like there's you know more factors to this and i feel like um it was worth commenting on. Uh, a lot of artists jumped on to the whole fix the cover type deal and they drew it in their own styles and all that other stuff, which I thought was a great positive uh, outlook. I mean, um, 
Jay Foskett and a bunch of others that I saw were rather interesting. Even Jules Rivera threw her, her hat into it with her own um, commentary on it, which was hilarious. <laughs> I thought I thought it was perfect. But with with art, though, especially as an artist that that has evolved as you have for over 20 some odd years, you know, your style has changed as well. You see that from when you first started to where you are currently. And in fact, it gets to the point where if you don't evolve your style, you're you're just stuck in a rut creatively, I think. You have to change. Yeah. yeah. It's like you really can't, no matter how good you are. I mean, goddamn Arthur Adams, like Art Adams has changed. Yeah. Like Alex Ross like has changed like these like people who were like been pros since i was in fucking middle school <laughs> like their stuff has changed like and I, they get criticized a lot of unfair criticisms get thrown around like oh this guy that's all he can do it's like well i mean if i get it if you hate it that's all you see yeah. but it's like if you look like he's trying like he's tried to improve like liefeld has tried to improve like he draws feet he, I've seen him like trace like underdrawings and anatomy and use photo reference and stuff. It's like, I get it that it's a fun punching bag and they say stuff and stick their foot in their mouth and all that shit. And J. Scott Campbell, like the end of that thing, I went to bat for him like crazy. He had me all the way up to the end. I was like, yeah, man, like good for you. Like he was donating to charity and whatever else. And then right there at the end, he just fucked up the end. Mm -hmm. He could, He didn't stick the landing. Because he was like, well, oh, you know, I just want to say a comic's good. I just think they're probably okay, you know, and far be it for me to judge. And I was just like, oh, you just, you fucking kidding me? Like, <laughs> wow. And he even admitted he didn't know what he's talking about. I haven't been paying attention to all this stuff. It's not, you know, on my radar. It's like, cool. Well, you don't have to comment about it. Yeah. Like, if, if you don't know what you're talking about, it's totally cool to not say shit because... I, I like I sent him a DM and I was like, hey dude, you know, it's like I realized that you might not know this, but like they harassed Darwin Cook's like widow and like they've harassed a bunch of pros. I was like, there's a lot of harassment going on. I was like, it's not like I was like I I seen the replies to his thing and they're like, Oh, it's all it's all misconstrued. We're all just we're just being misrepresented. That's just not how it is. And that's not all of us and stuff. And it's like that's fine, but like if you're part of a group and that group is out there doing that stuff and it's super visible mm. like what are, what are people supposed to think so i got a soft spot for those old artists at the same time it's like if some random person on tumblr fixes your shit just realize that if you fire back at them people are probably just going to feel sorry for this person your message is lost i think like a lot of these people they get vilified and people hate a character that they think is that person whole social media dude like yeah, even since me and you talked it's just a whole weird it's a weird game now the amount of social media that's changed um from what facebook when it was when it was just beginning to what it currently is now which is just basically a whole bunch of advertisements and fake profiles to one minute videos of tiktok to whatever the next to, to nfts to whatever else is happening um make sure you buy your dogecoin i guess too but um <laughs> <laughs> with with everything that's that's been occurring in everything gets lost the message gets lost your work gets lost your creativity gets lost you're fighting against seven billion people basically to be noticed by a handful and to to constantly struggle against it to expect to not be noticed or to not get not even promoted like i mean social media is is a, a black hole when it comes to being a creative person my content oh, yeah. gets lost your content gets lost everyone that i've interviewed is is posting so much more only to be consumed in 30 seconds and i'm glad you brought it up because it's like you talk about like oh what is the big change for raven's dojo like um you know i think about in terms of like that just what you just said mm -hmm. Like, it's like to throw all this stuff out there constantly and just kill yourself or whatever else. It's like, uh, you know, just to have an algorithm bury you yeah. or whatever. It's like, hey, man, you know, uh, I kind of was still running a rat race in my head. I was still in my head thinking, uh, you heard me talk. Like I said, oh, I was only doing three pages, but now I'm doing five pages and all this stuff. 
And, uh, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm just going to take my time and make the book a year. Like, I love that pace. It's a great pace for me. It keeps me, like, from getting stagnant. Like, I can't sit around and get too navel-gazy for too long. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I'm not doing it to pump content into uh, an ever fill an, an, an ever empty glass. Like I know you've heard the metaphor that social media and web content is like pouring water into a glass that never fills, right? And uh, anybody that's made content can relate to that. Um, and it's a shitty feeling. And I really think that we, we could all, like every creator could benefit greatly from just sort of stepping the fuck back and being like, hey, look, you know, um, none of this is as important as what it feels like. What we really just need to do is just focus on making work that we fucking love and work that has passion in it and that people can connect to. And it's like, hey, man, you know, if you get buried under like somebody that does 50 million post-it sketches and, or like, you know, they can do like a 30 second TikTok of them being like, and, like that's the you know, that gets like 70,000 likes and like yeah. you poured like eight hours into a page and it gets like one like or something like that. Yeah. It's okay, man, you know, don't feel bad. There, This whole structure was not built for what comic artists do. Yeah. It wasn't built for what most anybody does. Like this whole structure is advertising centric. When I started the internet, in 1998, like Raven's Dojo went up and advertising was setting the tone then. And it's crazy that advertising is still setting the tone for what goes online. But if you look at what, like the way advertising works is it just needs eyes. Like it doesn't matter what is drawing the eyes there. It could be a dog shitting or it could be like a masterpiece, but advertisements don't give a shit. Yeah. All that matters is that you're there. And it's it's like everything's impermanent and it's all like, oh, everything, everybody's making content. It's like, no, dude, I've seen artists push back. I'm glad the conversation's happening. I've seen artists push back and be like, I don't make content, I make music. Like I make a fucking album. Like I'm making stories. Like I do this stuff. I think the people making content are uh, vloggers, like YouTubers and Twitch streamers. And that's fine. Yeah. That's actually like that describes like right now the internet is geared towards video and it's geared towards streaming and like that perfectly describes like what they do like reactions you know it's what what would you call that like uh, other than content it's like me watching something else and you're just looking at like how i react to it and that's content you know it's disposable it's junk food it's not bad it's just it is what it is yeah. But it's like, I think a lot of creators get tied up in that rat race and it's like, nah, man, we got to unplug from that shit and just connect back to our work. Yeah. Like just make it on our own time schedule. You know? Like um, one, one of the major things that I attempted to do and, and as a single person doing all of this stuff with, in terms of content creation, whether it's a video interview or whether it's a book or, or a page or, or whatever, uh, to to create something on one medium and then try to distribute it to 47 other aspects of social media just so that it gets viewed once yeah it just as a single person you can't do it it's, it's demoralizing too right yeah it's it's frustrating in the sense that you know you're putting all this time into this one item to try to get a million views will it get there cool will it not probably not but it depends on how you've built your yourself and your fan base it's it's frustrating in the sense that you know i've i've given up on a lot of the social media i do what i can sure yeah. but i used to do five day a week interviews like five interviews a week holy shit dude i used to do it for two hours an interview <laughs> i'm doing now 30 minutes to 45 minutes because that's as long as I can maintain. And if it's a good interview, if it's a good conversation, I let it go longer. But for the most part, I can only do what I can do. I can only get you to talk about what you want to talk about for as long as you want to talk about it. Does that translate to views? More than likely not. So. But I think that like the uh, important thing is, is that I feel like there is that change, you know, like, um, there is, I think, the 
Patreon kicked it off, but we're past Patreon now to where I see people doing all sorts of different things. I'm doing something different. I'm not doing Patreon. Um, Patreon has some content issues where sometimes you can do dirty content and sometimes you can't. Like it's willy nilly. Like it's you're at the whim, honestly, of their random discretion. And I can't build a castle of sand. You know what I mean? Like I have to try and build something more concrete. Right. And so I'm just using like a WordPress plugin and it has a subscription function and I'm seeing all kinds of stuff. I'm seeing like Instagrams that have like a lock. And when you send them like a PayPal subscription, like all of a sudden they'll give you the password and you can get in. Um, still very much Patreon's a thing. You know, everybody's trying to roll out new stuff like Twitter, just put in a tip jar and shit like that. So it's like, I think what's cool and let this give you hope. I think that there is a recognized uh, problem that you can't really have all this humanity just throwing shit out there forever and getting nothing. Like they'll go away, they'll quit, and they'll leave, and it's like that sucks. Instead, we have now, I think, more intimate connections. Like, you might have a small fan base, but that's all you really need as one person. You know, they're giving you enough to keep it viable, to keep you going. And like, that's where the dojo is. It's like, I don't have a million fans. Like this 23 year story arc ended and I got probably less than five comments on the website, right? Other people would be like, oh God, it's demoralizing. Time to die, like time to kill myself. But it's like, no, man, you know, because the thing is, is that I have subscribers who uh, they like what I do enough to, you know, help me out. Yeah. And uh, every now and then, you know, I get a tip from a non-subscriber or something like that. But it's like, you can, at least that exists now. That didn't, that didn't exist before Patreon. It was all ads. It was all anybody knew was ads. If you, if they saw you making traffic, they'd be like, Oh, he must be making it. Even if you weren't. And at least now I think kind of like the secrets out, people are talking more openly. And that's why I talk like any, anytime I talk about all this, like, Oh, I'm doing so bad, Kurt. Like I can't publish my books and you know, all this shit. I'm not like, you know, it's not woe is me at all. It's just kind of like, it's important to be, like, I've never been, like, down with fake it till you make it. Mm. Like, it's important to be honest because I think that, like, people think that you might be, like, full-time or whatever else, and then they don't help mm. <laughs> when you need help. <laughs> like, you got to say sometimes. You got to look at people and be like, hey, look, you know, um, my graphics tablet died, and if I don't get $300, you know, no new page. And like, maybe people won't want to just give you $300 right. or maybe they will, but like, at least they know, you know, I think the way it was before is people would just sort of try to like bullshit and lie and, you know, try to pretend to be legit until they could get to that point. It's like, nah, man, I feel like now people just like are more upfront. I mean, 12 years, I, I've had some support in the past, but I, to the, it's gotten to the point where I either have to restructure what I'm doing. Mm -hmm or I have to figure out a different way to showcase the show. I mean, restructure at least every year, never, never stick it out. Raven's dojo. It's, it's funny because like, I always say people think all Raven does is Raven's dojo, but I honest to God have it on the chopping block every single year. Every single year I look at things and I say, well, if this doesn't work, then we're going to go in this direction. Mm -hmm. You know, people have seen there's very visible results of that. The color just wasn't working. Uh, I was too slow, you know, and when I was done, I was going to have a book that I couldn't afford to print. Mm -hmm. Didn't make sense. It's bad business. You know, if, if every single book that I make is a, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollar wall that I have to hurdle, that's not sustainable. Right. Plus it's storage. It's like, fuck, it didn't make any sense at all. So I, I ditched color and it's like, okay, you know, uh, so I'm cranking out books and, uh, that's going well, but it's also too, it's like, well, if you're doing these big story arcs, 
you know, what happens? That's kind of what happened with this story arc. I was like, do I really want to put out like book one, knowing that I'm like probably like three years from this being complete? You know, that's weird, right? Like uh, people buy book one and then they have to wait an entire other year. It's just not how things really roll. And so I was like, well, I need money in the meantime. You know, like I have bills like now, like I need help now. And so I was like, well, I'm going to do a paywall, you know, even if it means that the dojo slows down because you always have to do something extra, you know, or whatever, you know, but like, it's always a matter of changing gears. You never get to rest. What works for you um, for a long time is just still not guaranteed. And it's so funny, me and you having this conversation because I just read uh, this Ask Awada. Oh, yeah, I've seen that around. So what's funny is it really is just a business book. <laughs> if you want Nintendo anecdotes, uh, like, oh, you know, I, we used to have a janitor who looked like a gorilla and he inspired Donkey Kong. Like, that's not what it is, right? It's business. He's talking business the whole time. And one of the things that he says is he says that he learned from the old, like the family president, like Iwata learned from the family president that like, uh, you cannot succeed by just going forward. You can't. Like you just, you cannot. You have to change. You have to divert course. You have to do things that are sometimes maybe even confusing or like might seem nonsensical or whatever else. But only through change can you guarantee that you're going to sustain. Because if you just keep doing the same thing, you will fail. You Inevitably, it will crash like maybe it'll go well for you for a long time but like it will eventually crash and obviously the goal in business is to never crash right you just want to like keep going and growing right. and so like it's it was like weirdly validating like i read that and i was like oh shit that's what i've been doing but like um you know the video games like i told you like in 2012 i thought well maybe i might make a video game and then like uh you know that got back burnered for years but then last year i was like well you know, I, the paywall is going good, but it needs to do more. Like I need to hit non dojo readers, like somehow I was like, what, what video content can I do? You know, mini comics. I mean, you know, maybe like motion comics is what I meant to say, like, eh, you know, or trailers. Sometimes you see creators make trailers, video trailers mm -hmm. or something. I wanted a video presence. And then I was like, well, I mean, you know, I kind of know how to make a video game. Like, I should make a video game. Yeah. And so last year, I made a video game. Like, goddamn Galactic Gorilla's got to go. <laughs> and it was a Raven's Dojo video game. So, again, it's like if you play the game, it introduces you to the characters and the world and my sense of humor. And my, I did cut scenes, like 90 hand-drawn like, cut scenes. So it's got, like, it's a dojo story. Nice. Like, I consider it to be canon. But, like, the real purpose of that video game wasn't that I thought, man, this is a world beater. Like, oh, this is the next Last of Us. And no, not even close. Like, nobody gives a shit about me or what I do. But this video game is a new opportunity for me to hit eyes that would never see the comic and would never go to a web page and would never, like, give anything that I'm doing a chance but they they might play a video game like if they see something like a cool gif you don't even have to do video these days if you have a cool gif of something cool happening people might be like oh shit well, you know what is this like this looks cool and then you get a chance and that's all you can ever ask for is just a chance but like this is a chance i i made new like paywall subscribers from the video game and so you know it was a risk that like at least paid off a little bit it's again not crazy it's not like i'm like ready to like give up comics and make video games but yeah you got to change what you do at least like once a year you got to do something new and i think that you have a uh super kick-ass like you know legacy of uh like a thousand interviews i mean my god dude like you got to be like fantastic at this shit by now <laughs> And also, too, that huge body of work, like you can lean on it and like repackage it in different ways, like, you know, snippets. There's a lot you can do, Kurt. Don't sell yourself short. Man. You've got like a talent that I think is completely viable and you just got to shake it up. 
Well, it's funny because I've been really debating bringing back the podcast. Um, and the funny thing about that is my archive from 2017 back to 2000 and no, basically 2018 back to 2008 is gone. Digitally Ooh. is digitally gone online. I have the physical copy still. Oh, okay. Thank God. I thought you were saying it was like lost. <laughs> well, I was like, oh. it, it, but it was because someone notified me a while back. They're like, Hey, your podcast isn't playing. I'm like, what? And so I went to talk shoe, which was my host and I had three episodes up <laughs> and they didn't notify me whatsoever. Yeah. So a Twitter conversation here and there. And they're like, Oh, well, you know, just reupload it. I'm like, yeah, is that all? Yeah, sure. I'll get right on that because you know, right. not like let me just flip the switch, yeah, right? Sure. I'll, I'll pull that right out of my ass, anyhow. Um, but <laughs> I, I do have the MP3s from the very beginning, so the old TGT web comics back in the day when I first started with Phil, and so I have that. And I was I've wanted to either put it behind a paywall, as hey, here's here's my archive. Uh, you know, you want to get it, support me do it do it you have here's the thing this is the thing about this stuff creatives you know of any stripe anybody comment music whatever video whatever you're making try it out you have nothing to lose you can course correct at any time there's no timeline there's no like there's no right or wrong thing there's no like one magic thing like there's no one magic bullet that works for everyone I think that's so important for people to realize you know you hear it all the time like why don't you do this it's working for blah 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 it's like well it's not guaranteed to work for me and it might not even work for him forever some of the hugest names in web comics that i know some of the hugest names in like print comics too the direct market like huge legendary people they have tried stuff and just totally like uh fucking flopped you know they don't throw up their hands and say well shit they, they just like try something else and and that's literally like i think like not being afraid of like failure you know not being afraid of like fucking up is like important you know otherwise i mean if you just let things like knock you down and then you never try to like just change it up there, even even within my own like uh paywall stuff I, I can blanketly say it's like, oh, I made a paywall and the paywall's doing good. And the paywall wasn't always doing good. Like I started the paywall and it was doing okay, and, but people weren't reacting really to what I was doing. And so I had to change it up. And then what I was doing was working really well, but unfortunately it was actually working too well. Mm. And I stopped doing Raven's Dojo as much as I wanted to because the book of your pace suffered because the paywall the things that i was doing to make the paywall succeed started to fill my time too much right and so i was just like you know i gotta again course correct i got i had to like dial it back and i lost some people you know people like totally were like eh, you know that's what i was there for and they quit and they like took out and i lost money but it's like in a long run i mean you're gonna go up you're gonna go down whatever but it's like you got to just keep trying stuff out. Like you can't, you just don't get to rest easy. <laughs> like you gotta, you gotta change it up forever. Cool. Forever. Like no matter who you are, like even the very best people I know, the people I know who have had careers for 20 and 30 and 40 years. I will say Eric Larson, like the man is doing ant number one. And you got to think like, he doesn't have to do that he doesn't have to do ant number one it's coming out in like a few months it's like, like it, it, he's got it made in the shade like he, he was all those image guys were millionaires back in the 90s yeah. he doesn't have to do fucking anything he doesn't want to he's rich but it's like at the same time it's like he he's still doing comics because he loves to do them and savage dragon became more mature in tone and this new book is going to be more all ages and you can see a very like practical, logical through line there. It's like, you know, you can't just do this one thing forever. You have to do different stuff. Yeah. Here's the thing is you'll change it up. You'll find something that people are reacting to. 
and then you'll tweak that a little bit more. And people will react more to that. And you'll tweak that a little bit more. And you might lose some people. You'll be like, oops, you know, tweak it back, you know. But, like, it all works out. You'll get it. And what's huge for you is that you have the uh, benefit of experience. Like, you have all those shows. And somebody starting out fresh doesn't. And so you have a huge body of work that you have done and that body of work will help you keep on dude keep on Kurt. keep kicking ass speaking of kicking ass though or at least asses in general um you've changed up your career to <laughs> definitely be uh, a little more in the flesh so to speak yeah i 100 percent, with no shame will tell you like i'm a pornographer now like for sure Raven's Dojo rode the line. Like a lot of people didn't really know like what the fuck to say. Like I got to talk about Project Wonderful. They sent me an ad one time. They're like, well, we got a special category just for you because like we, you, you're not porn. They're like, but also too, like you're definitely not like family friendly. <laughs> They're like, so really like here's this weird, like, fucking category of ad that's going to be on your site now and i was just like wow that's weird but like i had been dealing with that since 1998 i'm a child of the 80s like everything i grew up with had boobs in it mm -hmm. and like sexual humor and like you know airplane and naked gun and oh, all that stupid classes. shit it was just part of it people were like i've been like had every insult hurled my way like, oh you're edgy you just think you're edgy and hardcore and it's like i'm not i don't think i am at all like i really think the shit I'm doing is some of the tamest shit on the internet. It's really like pretty, pretty not edgy at all. But like people, for some reason, were like, I was getting, I was getting treated that way. You know, I was getting treated like I was some kind of like uh, frothing at the mouth, like pervert or something like that. Oh my God, he's the next reincarnation of our crumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, really, like people were like, oh, you definitely must like, and they'd be naming some like fucked up shit. Like, and I'm like, well, I mean, I do, but like is that what you see when you look at my work like it's really not and so i was getting all the like flack and none of the benefit right <laughs> like i was getting treated like uh this embarrassing thing and i wasn't reaping any of the rewards like at all like i had one kickstarter i'll never forget the guy i sent him his uh sent him his book and I did a lot of envelope art. Nobody asked me to. It wasn't a tear or anything. I was just that, like, super thankful. Mm -hmm. And I was like, thank you. You know, you made a dream come true. Raven's Dojo. And just a big picture of Rodney with a peace sign or just something like that. Yeah. And uh, he sent me a message. And he's like, man, you know, thanks. Like, really cool, like, envelope art. Like, I appreciate it. He's like, unfortunately, I had to tell my wife what Raven's Dojo is. <laughs> and, and I was like... Well, I didn't know I was your dirty little secret, dude. Like, sorry, <laughs> like my bad. But, or I would have kept it a secret, you know? We're talking about changing course. I recognized the problem. Um, I was uh, getting treated in that way. And I was not like lumped in that category. And I wasn't like making money like that. Mm. Like I, I was like, my work wasn't like, really there was no actual nudity. It was, might be like a nipple no genitalia like just a nipple you might see a nipple tops and like that was it no risky business but everything was austin powers nudity and like you know tight clothing and nothing really crazy or scandalous yeah. and then um i just made a decision i was like well fuck it you know i'm gonna go crazy and do like if, <laughs> if this is how i'm getting treated this is what i'm gonna do then and so like i put hardcore sex in the dojo like you know at one point rodney fucks his girlfriend and like you see everything like it's like penetration and like people were like oh my god like you know what the fuck like and i was like here you go guys like it's been a grown folks comic for a long time it's let's just fucking own it yeah you know the dojo is going to get like more and more perverse as time goes by i'm actually not going to shoehorn that shit in like anywhere like it actually did happen at the moment that it happened for a reason narratively right that being said it's like well now that that genie is out of the bottle now that, that toothpaste is out of the tube it's like well, i'm gonna have fun with it you know sure. um and of course behind the paywall if you have a paywall i hate to say this but like i feel like if you have a paywall people expect some porn like some kind of dirtiness 
<laughs> especially if you're a cartoonist right yeah because it's like man people are horny for everything you, resident evil eight right yeah yeah you've seen you seen know, the like the I, tall yeah, lady yeah. lady d like it's like she's like her the close-ups like her makeup is like pasted on and you can see her teeth are like gray and yeah. It's like she's meant to be ghoulish and gross, but people want to fuck that like giant monster woman's brains out. And it cracks me up because it's like, it's weird. I never had any problems with sex or like prudishness feel or feelings or anything. I literally was holding back before, like in the past, just because of like mostly advertising. Like advertising, if you had explicit content, like you could push the envelope really far. But if you had explicit content, like they would pull your shit and you wouldn't make money. Yeah. That was the embarrassingly, that was the main reason to kind of like rein it in any. Mm. And like for the dojo, advertising hasn't been a thing for like fucking years. Years. Yeah. <laughs> like years. And so I was like, well, I don't have to deal with that albatross anymore. Like let's let's fucking cut loose. Like let's have the shit be as like wild as we fucking want. I love it. I think it's great. It's been fun. You talk about like making changes and them improving things for you, right? like i tried to befriend so many comic artists over the years and there's a weird thing in comics where like people won't really super be your friend depending on the content that you make <laughs> like if you make something i've had people i had people send me a message and they were like dude i love your stuff but i just can't like retweet anything because it will like hurt my brand and i'm like Ooh. <laughs> yeah that's tough okay <laughs> Um, not safe for work artists are so cool and so chill and they love to share work and they love to like get in there and talk and make jokes and like this stuff that like other people might be like oh that's embarrassing or oh I can't believe you put that on my timeline or get that out of here <laughs> like that that's what they're there for like that's what they want right and so yeah it's, the whole experience has been super positive for me man like my fans love it i love it like i've made more friends like it has been fantastic i think if anybody is on the fence over whether they should or shouldn't you you should like if if you especially if you're like me and you like get treated in that sort of weird middle ground just go on in yeah i see i don't know where i fit in terms of because i've been doing this for so long i've hit so many different areas I mean, I had a, I've had a latex model on the show a couple months back and she's now done a documentary about latex. So I'm going to have her back on a uh, psych mm -hmm. in the future. Um, but I've also interviewed, you know, the big four with, uh, Dave Killett and Chris Straub and all those guys. And I've Danielle Corsetto, et cetera, the, the staples of web comics way back when. And then I've interviewed actors and directors and people. And I'd like to showcase everyone I possibly can to push the envelope towards that style. I have no problem with it. Hell, give me a porn star. I'll have them on the show. No problem. Especially if they like geeky stuff, even better. You know, at least I have there's a, a lot a standard. So there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of crossover there is what's funny. Yeah. Um, I think that like the benefit of a talk show format is that you can have, uh, you know, your cake and eat it too. Like I think people, don't necessarily they wouldn't lump you in necessarily oh you just that kurt everything he does is filth like that wouldn't really necessarily be the thing because you're on this side of the podcast and they're on that side yeah and so but if you're worried about it if you're worried that it might change the tone it can always be subscribe content mm -hmm. like um there's a podcast i listen to and they have podcast they have like subscriber exclusives and then they have stuff they just put out there for everyone and beyond the shadow of a doubt they are more blue they cuss more and get more like lewd behind the paywall of course yeah like absolutely so i think that like you don't even have to like you know pop your shirt off and start talking about your favorite sex positions <laughs> like you could just you know just if you're talking to somebody who you think might be sort of more risque just put a preview up and be like hey guys you know subscribers only check it out I like <laughs> Actually, it could work there's something I, I i started a long time ago and i never really brought it back but it was the it was called the um after hours mm -hmm. and it was after the show itself and i have old content that 
is is pretty amazing in itself. So uh, it would be interesting just to throw some of that old stuff up on that paywall. But see, and here's what's so funny. It's like you talk about like, you know, again, it's it's this weird world that we live in. But like you talk about, like you said, you had Danielle Corsetto on there. I'm like, certainly Danielle does adult content. Oh, yeah. Like, and it's like, I mean, nobody has a problem. It's like, it just depends. So yeah, it's, I think there's not really, there doesn't have to be this weird, to circle back to that J. Scott Campbell thing, it doesn't have to be this weird lines in the sand. It's, it's part of the human experience. It's like eating. We all eat, you know, we all grow old, we all die, and probably at some point in your life, you're going to fuck. Or think about it, or fantasize about it, or wonder something about it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, dude, it's just human. You're just human. It's nothing weird and like this weird, like scandalous, dirty thing. You don't have to feel ashamed. It's a weird shame. I'm just not into the whole shame thing. It's yeah. like, don't, don't, no need to be like, no need to like, you know, turn the lights down and like, you know, turn on your two geeks talking. It's like, <laughs> just let it play. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what it is, dude. It's that safe for work, not safe for work. Yeah. Anytime you can create that like duality, people like just like, boo, and like they make it their whole thing. Night, day, good, evil, safe for work, not safe for work. It's like, yeah, but your life's not work. Like work is just, should be the smallest part of your life. Like work is just how you get fucking electricity in your house and food on your table. Work's not who you are, I hope. Like I know people spend a lot of time at work, but like don't let that stop you from being a fully realized well-rounded individual you know is there something you want to talk about that we haven't talked about yet because somebody asked me what we're doing next with the dojo and i just wanted to say like the only th- the only question we got asked <laughs> but like basically uh raven's dojo is not over and it will probably be something i do till the day i die i am going to keep my one book a year pace i love it and i have 50 million ideas uh, never short of ideas for the dojo, especially not now with the new status quo. There's a million things, but uh, right now I got to do house cleaning, and I, I I'm going to actually be getting a bunch of books in the POD form. POD is better than I ever fucking hoped. It's like really great now. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a lot of stuff available in POD, and there's going to be a new video game, and there's uh for the dojo comic the very next thing is yet another story that i've been waiting to do a long time and it's pretty dirty and it's pretty violent it's awesome it's really fun i think you're gonna like it um but a lot of comedy like we did a lot of really like serious like the last four years has been super serious and like dramatic and like you know tear jerking moments and stuff like that and uh we're gonna be going to a lot of shorter comedy stuff and so if you've not been wanting to read because it's daunting or it's too much or 12,000 pages is too much or whatever, just jump in on like something small, like the next thing. It'll be one issue or two issues and that's it. Not doing any more big story arcs like that. It's all just going to be fun stuff from here on. So yeah, fun stuff ahead. Kurt, take it away, brother. From a professional standpoint, you've been doing this for 23 years. You have done eight books, at least from Raven's Dojo. You have hundreds more in your head, I'm sure of that. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, um, I couldn't be happier. My personal definition of success is that you do something that you love, that's uncompromising, and it finds an audience that accepts it. And I absolutely have an audience. I mean, they're not like, you know, giant, we're not talking like PVP or like, you know, no, nobody's like falling all over themselves. They'll be like, oh my God, Raven, come to our show or whatever else. It's like, you know, be real about it. Like I'm still super obscure, but at the same time, uh, I have done exactly what I want for my whole career and I am getting opportunities now through the paywall to do things that I wanted to do that I never thought I could do like regularly payroll like my friends like give my friends money to draw guest pinups for me and stuff or do these video games uh you know things that I never thought I would do I'm getting a chance to do so yeah 
I am uh, no, I'm no world beater, but personally, I think it's really important to define success on your own terms and don't measure yourself up against, you know, if, if you compare me to someone else, almost anyone else, I'm a failure, like 100%. Like I have no confusion about that. That being said, you know, personally, I feel fantastic. I'm having the time of my life making the comics that I fucking love. And uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. You know? The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, man, they're, they're constant. <laughs> they never stop, right? So the thing is, is that uh, if, if you're failing it's not really like a, a, catast a, a catastrophe. It's like, if you're failing, you just have to, you know, realize, hey, no big deal. There will be another opportunity. I just have to change it up. And everything that you do, you know, is forward momentum, even failing. Like if you create something and it flops, no big deal, because that taught you something and be like, oh, well, I can take this and I can do that, you know? And so, yeah, everything is useful. Failure is especially useful. Success isn't like as much of a teacher as failure is. Like you'll learn more from like fucking up. And uh, yeah, man, I don't sweat failure at all. It helps that I failed a lot. <laughs> it, it helps that I've like not taken any great huge fall you know, there's not been any like tumble from the top, but like, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just another, it's another thing. When you're making pages, like the timing on this is perfect. Like I made two pages in a row because I'm trying to get caught up on Devil Powered Witches, which is like a paywall comic. And I'm behind, so I kind of was like just, you know, head down, cranking them out. And then I uh, got some distance from them and I looked back at the last two pages and I was like, well, these, you know, pages suck. Like they're fucking, they're shitty. They're not good. Like I, I'm kind of like not satisfied with these. And I was like, you know what? No big deal. Just go back and redo. Like, it's fine. Crumbled that shit up. I spent hours on that page. Just crumbled it up, toss that shit away and just get back in there and make another one. And I think being a comic artist helps because it's like, you always have that, like all being an artist helps. Like all art is abandoned. You know what they say? Like that's all cliche. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, you're never going to have anything be perfect. Like you're always going to have to just walk away. And uh, that's it, man. It's like, if you fail, so the fuck what? <laughs> just try again. Yeah, so the fuck what? Who, who cares? You know, oh, no, I failed. It's like, there's, when you think about it, Kurt, it's like, like what, what really like are the, what really are the like things that can destroy you? like rejection. if you i mean like even rejection it's like man like we talk about like hard things like brother like i suffered some insane rejection like destroyed my life like i was like in dark 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 places and i don't put my dark shit on the internet because it's like i don't like to spread misery but it's like just me talking to you like man you know i i have learned like that like uh you know i'm not really what you call a hot commodity <laughs> in in comics in like love and like i've had friends betray me and shit like these have been some crazy years since me and you last talked but it's like you live i mean you know you, you keep going you just keep doing your thing if i fucking like got a disease that killed me that would be the thing you know yeah like if i got my hand cut off i would just do something else creative Hmm. Now, there's no reason that they'll let rejection and failure and stuff destroy you. Everyone has one or two people that kind of inspired them on their path to where they are today. And they can be professional or personal. Uh, who is that for you? Um, it's pretty obvious. Anybody who knows me uh, knows, like I'm a host on the Savage Finn cast, like the Savage Dragon podcast or whatever. But uh, Eric Larson is an obvious and huge influence. Like here's a guy who uh, his characters, he had them since he was a kid and he went on and he just, you know, made a career out of it. 
And, uh, you know, Eric's not the only one that has done that. Like Bone, Jeff Smith's Bone. Yeah. Those characters were as old as kindergarten. And my characters are as old as, like, I had Rodney and Dornell since kindergarten, for sure. And even, like, uh, Kenyon was a character I made up in, like, third grade. And it's like these, uh, like, Eric, you know, is probably the most like influential like one-to-one like the like as far as like here's a person who is taking his childhood creations and he's just doing what he wants and he's just making comics that he personally cares about he's not even necessarily worried about mass market appeal he's just fucking doing what he wants and it's like that's very appealing to me um our crumb maybe not like i'm not going for like shock i'm not obsessed with like you know shock and offensiveness and shit like kind of like people think i am but like i really don't i'm not out to like flip your shit all the time (laughs) um but like i just liked that he just let it hang out there you know he's a fucking weirdo and he just liked weird shit and he just put it in his work and i think kind of like that uncompromising uh nature really 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 speaks to me and then lastly uh like oda like uh the dude behind one piece just because again you know here's a guy who doesn't have to work like one piece is the most popular comic in the world he doesn't that shit didn't have to go on as long as it did it's been going on as long as it did because he fucking loves doing it and you can tell you know, I hear people criticize it, and it's like, man, if you read that, there's so much passion in that comic. Like, he loves, you can feel the love and excitement still after all these years. You can feel the love and excitement, and that's mainly it. I just like those auteurs. I like those people who just deliver, like, uh, entertainment in their voice, and they don't really compromise. They just do things, like, that they like, and they do things the way they like. And yeah, I would say those three cats. And I know that's some weird, like, Crumb, Eric Larson, and Oda, but, like, they're the guys I relate to the most. (laughs) The younger generation are looking at your work, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, either becoming an artist or becoming a writer, or however they would like to be creative. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? You know... I think that what the uh, next generation can do to inspire the generation past them is just step away from the uh, misconception that work for hire at corporate comics is like the plateau. Like that's the big time making it or any of that stuff. Uh, Even now we still have creators who uh we things are better like i think you have more and more creators who like have no desire to make corporate comics ever and uh that's great but i still think that there is a huge chunk of people who they do have that dream and that goal or whatever else and it's not not to shit on anyone's dreams everyone has different dreams and that's not what i'm saying like i'm not saying that you're bad or you're wrong if that's what you want to do but what I think needs to change to really help comics and really help inspire people is to just tell them, you know, that you can tell your story. Like you can put your stamp on comics and it doesn't have to be filtered through the lens of like Bruce Wayne or Peter Parker, you know, uh, that's not a validation necessarily a feather in your cap that like the way that it's been presented in the past, it's like more important and more vital to just comics the medium to just have people that are out there just more auteurs like i said more people just telling their story because you see all the things that like we really uh, had corporate comics struggling with like representation of like uh, marginalized people you know, people of color trans uh, lesbian, bi, um, intersex. It's like we don't need to force necessarily uh, voices into that space where they're automatically going to be minimalized against the likes of legacy characters like Captain America and Thor and stuff like that. It would be more potent and more powerful if we just had 
people telling their story and then, you know, people reacting to that so that you have this uncompromising, uh, again, I hate to keep like going to that well, but it's just, it's important. You know, uh, I think it's important that we get those unique voices out there in the mix to keep this medium like relevant and vital and uh, thriving. I think that the more you do that stuff, the more it's gonna enrich comics, the more it's gonna help everybody. Like a rising tide lifts all ships. So it's like, hey man, it can only help if you're out there telling your story. Don't rush necessarily to get in line to be the next guy to draw Spider-Man because at the end of the day, they're just gonna be another guy to draw Spider-Man. And you're gonna make a way bigger impact if you tell your story. So yeah, I think that what this next generation can do they already the wheel has begun moving in that direction i think just keep it going just keep emphasizing that it's more important to do your thing and tell your story than it is to necessarily be work for hire no big two you know that it's like they're not the big two it's not making it you're just freelance like at the end of the day your work is just another drop in a bucket instead stand out make your own work tell your tale i like that good stuff well raven i do hate to say this but uh that has to wrap up our interview today i mean we've got to stop connecting whatever eight years or so <laughs> <laughs> like let, i'll let's try, try to be more interesting <laughs> well i was gonna say let's try to do it every every couple of years at least just to make things consistent i, I like consistency I'm down with it. Always, <laughs> always a pleasure. It's always fun. I remembered. I was like, oh yeah, that Kurt. He's a good guy. He's a good egg. I, I, I will gladly be on this show once more. <laughs> <laughs> Before I let you go, there, where can we find you on social media and all of that other fun stuff? The beautiful thing about me is that I'm incredibly easy. I am Ravens Dojo R A V E N S D O J O on pretty much whatever you want. I do Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. So you can pretty much just twitter.com slash Ravens Dojo, Instagram.com slash Ravens Dojo. Even Ravens Dojo, it can get there. If you want to go to my site, ravensdojo.com, that is going to lead you to all that other stuff. And so, yeah, man, just remember the magic phrase and you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. And Raven, thanks again for coming on the show. I do appreciate you as always. And I think we had a wonderful discussion, not only about the various industries, but about how hopefully everyone can make their own mark in this world. Uh, I had a great time, man. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So tune in next week for another great interview on Two Geeks Talking, where... Everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Uh, I'm not sure who we have on next week, but I'm sure it's another great and talented person, and maybe someone from the future as well, if I recall correctly. Someone from the future? Yes, from the Philippines, actually. Ooh. <laughs> Be there, folks. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for listening watching. Tune in next week. Hey, all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening and watching over the years, and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.